Now on BBC One, this week's Inside Out with Jamie Coulson. Hello and welcome to Inside Out from York. This week we're exploring the tragic past of one of Yorkshire's oldest and most notorious psychiatric hospitals. We meet the former patients who were subjected to experimental surgery back in the 60s and 70s. It totally destroys your brains. It must turn to mush. Also tonight, the Yorkshire soldiers who defied the Nazis. The secret wartime newspaper produced in terrible conditions in a prisoner of war camp. And Viking treasure. The father and son from Yorkshire who made one of the most important historical finds this century. For more than a century, High Roads Hospital has been treating mentally ill people from across Yorkshire. But back in the 1960s and 70s, some patients were subjected to controversial experimental treatments, including invasive surgery. Charlotte Leeming's been to meet two former patients who are still living with what happened to them nearly half a century ago. We should warn you that you may find some images distressing. When he switched it on, nearly blew my head off, and I realised then that was the first time that I realised that they were going to kill me, that I was going to die somewhere along the line here. Here we have a place where we can actually remember these people, give them some dignity, give them something that they weren't given in life for many of them. This will enable me to fill some gaps in my family history it's fantastic, it it's really is. The West Riding Pauper Lunatic Asylum opened its doors in 1888 and for the next century it would look after many thousands of mentally ill patients. The lucky ones would eventually get to leave but for scores of others they would be here for decades or even lifetimes. Initially built as a warehouse for the insane, its focus was on containment and restraint, but the next 50 years would see it transformed. Like other psychiatric hospitals, Hyroids used radical new therapies, including electric shock treatment and, more controversially, neurosurgery. When the asylum was built, there was no expense spared in creating a very grand impression. And of course, that Victorian splendour may have faded considerably now, but you can still imagine how intimidating it must have been for the patients arriving here. Derek Hutchinson was admitted to Hyroids in 1973, following a breakdown. They said they were depressed. A little complete lie. I was never depressed except when they started giving me Ligactyl and that Alipuridol. Then they were hitting me with ECT. It totally destroys your brains. It must turn to mush. Derek underwent 10 courses of electric shock treatment during his first five months at Hyroids. He was then recommended for experimental brain surgery, a partial lobotomy. The first thing that I really remember, it, when I come round with this bang, like a, like somebody eating on the back of the head with an hammer. And I thought, Christ almighty. And uh, I couldn't move, and I'm, I'm trying to see, but I couldn't, couldn't, I couldn't close my eyes. They had some, some sort of thing that kept my eyes open, and this nurse kept leaning over and squirting water, water and stuff in. When he, when he put electric, when he, when he switched it on, it nearly blew me off and I realised then that was the first time that I realised that they were going to kill me. That I was going to die somewhere along the line here. He said, leaned over and all I could see was his face and he said, Oh, he said, I thought you were a bit of a tough guy. Well, I, was, I don't know if you've ever been completely crazy, but that's one time I really was, because I couldn't get loose. Derek managed to leave Hyroids, but many didn't, and they ended up here. It looks like an empty field, but this was the hospital's burial ground for a hundred years. Nearly 3,000 people are buried here. 
What sort of people would we find in here, Mark? There are 212 Johns. There are 210 Marys. Um, they came from all walks of life, um, from the mills, housewives, labourers, the unemployed. Patients were buried in rows, four to each plot. There were no gravestones, just iron markers. You've only to look at the, the uh, through the chronic case books to see that people 40, 50 years in the asylum and end up, many of them, not just because they didn't have family to, uh, the family didn't want to pick them up, collect their remains and look after them, but many of them, the families were dead. Weren't around anymore. They'd, they'd been in the asylum that long. And you think it's important that we now hear their stories, the people that are buried here? Going to the archives and uncovering these people and finding this pic the pictures, it's almost like waving a wand and the people appear. And it really puts, puts it into perspective. You see these people and you read about the stories. And it, it, it's a sad, sad state of affairs. Someone who knows how important it is to hear the stories of former patients is Jean Davison. So Jean, this is the ballroom. You haven't been here for 40 years. 40 years, heck yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, I can remember this from when I was a teenager, about 68, 69. Every Friday, male and female patients will be brought together for a couple of hours of dancing. I remember one of the long-stay male patients asked me to dance and I didn't want to hurt his feelings by saying no, so I thought, well, what harm is there? But it was really like dancing with a corpse because he was so, obviously, so drugged up on that, you know, and it just, oh, for me, you know, it was just an horrible experience. Jean had gone to Hyroids as a voluntary patient. Within days, she was sedated and being given electric shock treatment. Five years later, and against medical advice, she discharged herself. I thought I was being treated for depression and couldn't understand why the drugs that I was on was making me feel more depressed, really drowsy and depressed. And it's only many years later I saw my case notes and found that actually I had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, which, which I dispute and which one of the other doctors I've seen from my case notes disputed. But once I got off the tablet, my interest came back and I could live again, yeah. Alan's story has come to the site to find out more about his great-grandmother, Cicely Sedgwick. She was buried here in 1954. Obviously, I've done a little bit of work on Cicely for you, Alan. Thank you. Um, and as we know, she's, she was buried in row nine, grave 28, which literally equates to here, where I've, I've, I've put the marker. And what, what reason have you been told for why she actually came into the asylum? Uh, the family tale is that, that she suffered from milk fever. Yeah. Don't know what milk fever is. I'm not really sure. You, I would imagine that's postnatal depression. Possibly, possibly. Yeah. Um, we do know that she spent the best part of 60 years here before being buried here. I understood that from family records, family history, but I didn't know where she was buried. Now I've found out, it means a great deal. No, and this is uh, a great gap filler for us, for our family. In 1953, Tom Booth came here as a student nurse. He was to witness at first hand a huge change in the way patients were cared for. Some of the experiments that were carried on here with medication, with drugs, um, had started with the Germans uh, during the war with what they were doing to people in concentration camps. Certainly they experimented with drugs on, pa on patients. It wasn't like that here. Psychiatry was using these drugs to try to improve people's conditions, not the way that they were being used previously. And they worked. People who were disturbed, couldn't keep still walking up and down, people whose thoughts were obviously in a mess, they became more tranquil when these medications took effect. He also saw the advent of the lobotomy. I have seen patients who were very distraught improve considerably with that, with that uh, procedure. 
one chap in particular I'm thinking of, he became useful to himself and he became useful to the hospital. And previously, he had to be incarcerated, he had to be kept in a ward, locked up, not allowed out, only under supervision, and, and life became a lot better for him. But not so for Derek. 30 years after his surgery, he still suffers vivid flashbacks of the operation and has been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Even so, when he feels well enough, Derek can be found at the Hyroids burial ground. Do you feel it's your calling, your mission now to help remember the patients buried there in the unmarked graves? They deserve it. You know, they've had, they've had everything thrown at them of the, those lads and lasses in there. And for them to be just thrown away, used, abused, and then thrown in the pit. That's not right, not even for, for an animal, is it? Coming up on Inside Out, treasure seekers. A father and son see their Viking treasure displayed in one of the country's...